At this point, we need a, a better um, understanding of what these interactions are that are occurring between molecules. So what I'm trying to draw here is uh, a couple of molecules, all right, a couple of molecules. And, and what I've done in the polymer section so far is drawn these little dotted red lines. And these are, you know, I've kind of called them, I've called it friction. But that's not really quite right. I mean, it's friction if there's strings or spaghetti. Um, but we got we need a better better description. And, and so, what what we need to understand um, first is that um, different elements, okay, different elements uh, attract electrons different amounts differing oh my goodness <laughs> differing that's better uh, amounts so for example if we had a molecule of HCl so we've got chlorine atom bonded to a hydrogen bond a uh, hydrogen atom and this solid line here this is the same as we've described over here we said was a strong bond okay this is the same thing this is a strong bond making up a molecule it's a primary bond but we haven't really formally introduced that yet so we'll, we'll get to that later it's a strong bond it's making up the molecule and well this chlorine is kind of like a you could think of him a, if you can allow me to to anthropomorphize this atom, I hope that doesn't frustrate you. But it's kind of like a—it's a bully. Um, you know, it's a schoolyard bully. He's, he's going to go and pick on hydrogen and say, "You know, I really like your electron. Can you can you give me your lunch money?" Type of thing. And um, you know, poor little hydrogen. Well, hydrogen has got one little proton in the middle and one little electron. And so what ends up happening is the electron. I'm just depicting it here in a cartoon sketch. Is this? kind of a cloud, the electron spends more of its time around chlorine. And so then what happens is that, en that ends up making the chlorine end of the molecule, because chlorine is attracting that electron, and electron is negative, it makes the chlorine end a little bit negative right it appears electrically a little bit negative in in charge okay and then the hydrogen because it's lost that electron it's got a, in its center it's got a little proton which is positive and we'll, we'll dive back into that structure in a little more detail but the hydrogen becomes a little bit positive From the, uh, the the proton that's exposed at the at the center of the of the atom, uh, I'll put that in here uh, in parentheses. I'll do exposed proton, and and we will come back to the structure of the atom in more detail. All you need to know at this point is there's this positive proton in the middle of the hydrogen there. So that's exposed. And that makes it a little bit positive. So now we've got two ends to this molecule. We've got uh, a positive end and a negative end. <clears throat> so then what would happen if you had, say you had two HCl molecules in the vicinity of one another. Well, you've got that little bit of a positive end on one and a little bit of a negative end on the other. And so there would be a charge attraction. There'd be this charge attraction between them between the oppositely charged ends, charge attraction. And it is that charge attraction that is the secondary bond. OK, and we'll explore it a little bit more. But that's, that's it. That's the secondary bond. Sometimes I use the symbol 2 degree for secondary. <clears throat> it's often drawn as a, da a, a, a dashed line like this to distinguish it from a strong primary bond. 
And the other thing that there's a little bit of notation I can introduce, we said little bit positive, little bit negative. So instead of saying that each time, which gets quite cumbersome, what we can do is we can say, we can use this, this little symbol, lowercase Greek letter delta, uh, which means little bit of, and little bit negative on the chlorine end, and then little bit positive, delta positive on the hydrogen end. And again, delta negative, delta positive. And that's showing that it's a little bit of positive charge, a little bit of negative. It's also important that when we write uh, delta, it reminds us that that is less than the charge on an electron. It's not this uh, the, the full charge that we have on an electron. That's something we'll get to when we discuss the ionic bond, you know, in the case of sodium chloride, for example. Um, but at this point, we're not talking about that full charge. We're talking about something less than the charge on an uh, electron. It's a little bit, and that's why we use the letter uh, the Greek letter delta. <clears throat> so this is actually an example. Um, technically, what we'd, we'd call what I've just explained to you is HCl is a, a permanent dipole. What does dipole mean? Well, dipole means so di means it's got two two what then and pole it's got two ends. Now, specifically, we're referring to an electric dipole. For example, the Earth is, there's the Earth spinning around on axis. Uh, <laughs> and it's got a north and, and, and a south pole, right? So it's magnetic. Uh, it's, got, it's a magnetic dipole. Um, and we're, we're talking with these molecules about uh, electric dipole. They've got charged ends to them. So you can identify one end or the other. There's another symbol that sometimes you use. Sometimes we put a little arrow that points towards the negative end. We draw a line through here, and that kind of looks like a plus. So that's the positive end. That's the negative end. So that's another shorthand way of describing this, these dipoles. How can you create a dipole? Well, we can have a permanent dipole, as I've explained here. We can also have... Um, uh, a temporary dipole, or we call them sometimes induced, or I'll group, uh, lump them together here, um, fluctuating. So these are um, dipoles that can, can exist in, in an otherwise nonpolar molecule. So um, O2, for example, in, in gas phase, O2 gas. Uh, that molecule there, well, oxygen is going to have the same pull on the electrons um, as it as, as one oxygen as another, right? So there's no reason that the electrons would spend any more time around one or the other, except for the fact that there's a finite number of electrons, and at any particular moment in time, you might find that in fact one end of that O2 molecule is a little bit positive and a little bit negative. So you might have, just by random fluctuation, um, a dipole established. You've got a positive end and a negative end. And you can also in do that same result by bringing a nonpolar molecule close to, to a charge. And it can cause, say, a negative charge came along on this side and pushed the electron cloud away. That would be an induced dipole. The result is that, anyway, at the end of the day, is that any time you bring two materials together, you will have interactions um, between molecules. And that is what the secondary bond is. The secondary bond occurs between dipoles. Whether permanent or induced or fluctuating, it occurs between, between dipoles. And they're always there. They're, they're much weaker than the primary bond. You put your hand on the table that you're sitting in front of right now, probably, and you're going to establish secondary bonds between your hand, the proteins in your hand, and the surface of whatever it is your, your desk is made out of. Uh, sometimes the secondary bond is, is referred to as a secondary interaction. Some people like the um, like to distinguish it from primary bonds, so they call it an interaction. Yeah, you may have heard of other names for this. 
the uh, van der Waals interaction. That's another A. Van der Waals, London dispersion forces, referring to the same thing. Okay, just a the way it was modeled. That's why it comes. It has this name for uh, a bizarre name, London dispersion force, but it's referring to the same interaction. Um, so it's all the same, the, the, the same, the same thing, and it'll happen between any two materials brought together. And then there's a special case of secondary bonding that I'll just wrap things up with. Well, what are the biggest bullies on, in, in the schoolyard? You know, what elements most strongly attract electrons? So that's the last thing we'll say. What are the biggest bullies? Biggest electron bullies? <laughs> electron bullies. And that is the ele the elements that uh, most strongly attract uh, electrons. There's a term that you may be familiar with. I'll just mention it now. Electronegativity. That's how much uh, a particular element uh, wants to attract an electron. Negativity. So the most um, strongly attracting of electrons, the elements that are most strongly attracting of electrons are oxygen, fluorine and nitrogen and what's the element that's easiest to pick on to bully well hydrogen with it's just it's one little electron and one proton so if we have hydrogen as uh, so oxygen fluorine or nitrogen bonded to hydrogen it sets up a really strong dipole for example hydrogen fluoride right the fluorine is much more um, attracting of that electron, and you get a strong dipole established. And then you can have between one of those molecules and another a strong secondary interaction between the partially negative end of one and the partially positive end of another. And you get that secondary interaction, at, and that is a special case or it's a kind of a we've we've defined it as humans as a special case it's still a dipole interaction a secondary interaction but we call that the hydrogen bond so it gets its own name just because it's particularly strong it's technically in mechanism it's no different from any of the other interactions but it's just we've just defined okay if you've got hydrogen bonded to oxygen fluorine and nitrogen you can have a hydrogen bond, and that's uh, that's quite important. We can actually use that, for example, in um, a strong polymer like nylon or Kevlar. There's hydrogen bonding that occurs between chains, and that contributes to its strength. So the hydrogen bond is quite important, and it's a special case of secondary interactions.